when you're just like Bush, still pushing the drug war in boot camp, labor camp, concentration camp. In America, rehab costs two-thirds less than prison. In Europe, they call this harm reduction, and it's already been proven to work in Holland and parts of England. And what do you know? Crime rates lower, HIV rates lower, and even the drug use rate is lower than the state. And where's the drive-by? Where's the gang? Harm reduction will take a far bigger bite out of crime than redneck vigilante bullshit like three strikes you're at. <laughs> if there's any way to make that work, please do. Where was I? Okay. Where's the drive? Oh, dri I said that one. Okay. Marijuana is less harmful than beer or cigarette. <laughs> I'm not sure about that, but we're pondering. Did aspirin make a mess out of you? Is that the problem? <laughs>
And let's use our billion dollar militarized space program to do something useful and send the FBI, the CIA, the DEA, the NSA, and the Pentagon to Mars. <laughs>
doesn't want to gas enough people. Therefore, they're soft on crime. So now they found a new, kinder, gentler way to kill people called lethal injection. They just shoot you up with the same heart-stopping drug that they do to put an animal to sleep and put the person to sleep that way. But I've been opposed to that since I was about that tall for one simple reason. What if they've got the wrong person? Since 1993 alone, 21 people have been set free, clear out of the prison system in the United States, who are on death row, scheduled to be executed, because it was proven that they didn't commit the crime in the first place. And the most best-known example of a probable innocent person who's on his way to getting killed I think this is probably even trickled up here knowledge of this one, a uh, former Black Panther activist, award-winning radio journalist named Mumia Abu-Jamal. <laughs> he's got one more court hearing and he's gone. And there's unbelievable pressure coming from the Philadelphia Police Office, Fraternal Order of Police, like just a white officer's union. They're also suing me at the moment over the con the back cover of the crucifix CD. But that's another story. Anyway, Philadelphia College putting pressure on the judge is not a pretty sight when somebody's life is at stake. So uh, I have this little record label called Alternative Tentacles, some of you may know about. Uh, a while back we released an album of radio commentaries that were taken off the radio by the Mia Abu Jamal. So we put out a Mia album and there's a second one we're putting out in about a month. And the first one was a split with a band called Man of the Bastard. The new one is going to be all Mia. If you see this, check it out because he's not just anybody accused of killing a cop who happens to be on death row. He's a very, very intelligent, eloquent person and uh, if he goes, history is not going to look very kindly on that. So this piece is for him. This is only supposed to happen in the movies. Henry Fonda in The Wrong Man. Harrison Ford in The Fugitive. North by Northwest. Thin Blue Line. An innocent person, when they least expect it, falls into an unbelievable chain of events and finds themselves accused of a crime they could not possibly have committed. Every step in the justice system goes wrong. All seems hopeless as the death chamber looms until finally, at the very last minute, the authorities are proven wrong, usually by the female love interest, and the accused is set free to live happily ever after as the credits roll. After all, this is America, where these sort of nightmares do not happen. Because our justice system is fair. Our justice system works. <laughs> now imagine you are a respected, award-winning, and courageous journalist whose news reports are sometimes critical of a notoriously violent and corrupt police department. Suddenly, the nightmare happens to you, shot through the liver at the scene of a crime. Instead of helping you, the cops beat you as you lie on the sidewalk and allegedly beat you again inside the hospital. Not in Haiti, not in China, but in the United States of America. When you wake up from surgery, the nightmare is still there. You are the one accused of what the corporate media tells us is the ultimate unforgivable sin, killing a police officer. You have no criminal record. Ballistics tests don't add up. The gun you had in your taxi cab was a 38. The bullet they dug out of a cop was a 45. There is plenty of evidence that you did not and could not commit this crime, but the nightmare just gets worse. Evidence that could clear you disappears. Witnesses disappear. A judge who has sentenced more than twice as many people to death than anyone else in the United States 
denies you a competent lawyer and denies you the right to defend yourself. Appeals are denied by the very judges who rule the opposite way in nearly identical cases. Not in Mexico, not in Nigeria, but in the United States of America. And unlike the movie, this time a headline hungry governor salivates like a giggling crocodile, eager to put a black man to death with the stroke of a pen to hold up as a trophy to enhance his political career. Why is our government so hell-bent on killing Mumia Abu-Jamal? Why are they so afraid of him? Of his voice? Of his way with words? The way he gives state-sanctioned murder victims a human face and a point of view? <clears throat> to the point where even a poem about him and the frightening law, government lawlessness in his case is banned from America's national public radio? Is it what he says about the country and ourselves in words so powerful and eloquent that our children may well one day study his now banned radio commentaries in school? The same way some now study the last words of Bartolomeo Ranzetti before he and Nicola Sacco were executed by the U.S. government in 1927 for a crime they did not commit. The real crime being they were anarchists. They were labor union activists. And if that's not enough, they were immigrants. <laughs> what have we become? What are we letting ourselves become? This isn't the movie. This is what America has become. A 1995 FBI investigation leads to six Philadelphia police officers pleading guilty to assault, framing defendants, stealing money, lying to obtain search warrants, and more, resulting in more than 100 criminal convictions being overturned, yet still no new trial for Mumia Abu-Jamal. And what of all the other wrongfully convicted human beings without Mumia's high profile and gifts for communication, caged like animals in our mushrooming prison industrial complex system, waiting to be killed by our government to satisfy generation execute America's sick thirst for human sacrifice and modern slavery. When Nigerian environmental and native rights activist Ken Sarawiwa was hanged on trumped up murder charges, the Nigerian government and Shell Oil were condemned all over the world as outlaws. Now we are the outlaws of the world in the case of Mumia Abu-Jamal. As more and more wealth is sucked upward by people who don't need it, and mass rage toward corporate America swells closer and closer to the boiling point, the official response is to keep the lid clamped on tighter and tighter and tighter. Through more and more police state actions like the ones we fought in World War II to eliminate from the face of the earth. If this is allowed to keep going, what has happened to Mia Abu Jamal could happen to other innocent people, like three guys in West Memphis, Arkansas, who are now served, two are serving life sentences, the third is on death row for the brutal murders of three little boys, and the evidence used to convict them weighed very heavily on the fact that they wore black clothing and listened to heavy metal. If you hear about that case, they're calling it the West Memphis Three. If allowed to go far enough, this could happen to anyone. It could happen to you. It could happen to me.
which is another new one from my new spoken word album, which unfortunately isn't out quite yet, but uh, will be out by mid to late October. It's called If Evolution is Outlawed, Only Outlaws Will Evolve. <laughs> now I'm going to be still by vinyl records. one because it's a triple picture disc of Winston <coughs> Smith art, so uh, should be cool. It used to be a big event when the president came to town, a public event, a very public event, where the president would ride down Main Street smiling in the back of a convertible or at least way from inside a limousine behind bulletproof glass, the president wanted to see the people, and above all, the people wanted to see the president. Be assured that the president is real. Be assured that from behind the confines of the limo glass, the president was still somehow one of us. <laughs> Photo opportunity, the common touch, an important sounding speech in public at an important looking building, a shining memory for each lucky peasant to treasure for a lifetime. See, there is a Santa Claus. <laughs> now our leaders know all too well what their people really think of them. It's rarely even announced more than a day or two in advance when they're coming, as they sort of sneak in and out of town in what is now treated as enemy territory to exclusive gatherings of the rich and powerful in limos with black tinted windows. The same kind of black tinted windows that get you pulled over by the cops if you're a regular person with black tinted windows. On suspicion, you must be some kind of criminal, a drug dealer, or a gangster, or something. Which is not too far from what people suspect of our leaders these days. Nowadays, instead of blowing off work or taking all the school kids downtown to try and catch a once-in-a-lifetime glimpse of the president, people who've heard the president might be in town see a black limo go by with some kind of police escort, and they feel suspicious, even resentful. Yeah, I'll bet that was the president that just went by. <laughs> then they turn around and go back to what they were doing. It's not an event, just a pain in the ass. And a reminder of the contempt that our once beloved rulers now openly hold for the rest of us. Like in Banana Republic, they accept hiding behind tinted glass, fearing for your life every hour of every day as just another cost of doing business. But then I find out we were pretty damn lucky. 
If the challenger had made it home, things might now be much worse because, according to the Nation and Common Cause and several astronomy magazine sources, NASA had its plan to send the next shuttle after the Challenger up into orbit carrying 46 pounds of plutonium. One speck can give you cancer and kill you. 46 pounds of plutonium. If that one had blown up, there'd be enough radiation scattered in the atmosphere to cause cancer in as many as 5 billion people. What's the population of the Earth, boys and girls? Uh, closer to five still, I think. But uh, the point is, how reckless can you get? How reckless can you get? Up, up and away! Run Star Wars the easy way! Just fire it up into the great beyond and don't tell anybody you put it there. After all, when people don't know what hurts them, they don't care. Just blame the fallout cancer epidemic on... Osama Bin Laden. <laughs> and think of all the money people we know and love would make selling how to cope with cancer kits to Martha Stewart's people. <laughs> and the That's why I'm glad the space shuttle blew up, because if one more had gone up and blown up instead, we might not be here. We never would have seen Mark McGuire hit 62 miles <laughs> But did we learn? No. Now I find out that last October, NASA launched the so-called Cassini probe to Saturn, carrying 72 pounds of plutonium. And Cassini went up a Lockheed Martin built Titan IV rocket, not known for its reliability, as in only about a month ago, another one of them blew up on takeoff. So far, so good. Cassini didn't blow up. But Cassini is not going straight to Saturn, it's going the opposite direction where it will rocket around Venus twice to gain velocity, then hurdle back towards Earth at over 42,000 miles an hour for a fast and low flyby scheduled for August 16th, 1999. Forget the millennium, that's the day that's important. <laughs> it's designed to use the Earth's gravity to then fire it further forward so it'll make it all the way to Saturn. One malfunction or one increment of a micron of miscalculation after over a billion miles of space, and Cassini could come too close to the Earth and burn up in the atmosphere and rain plutonium down all over the planet. Needless to say, none of the other people on Earth that could get killed if the slightest thing goes wrong were never ever asked, is this worth it? And if that's not enough, the 72 pounds of plutonium aren't even being used to power the rocket or the main parts of the satellite, but to fuel three radio radioisotope thermal generators, otherwise known as RTGs, to run the probe's instruments. By producing 745 watts of electricity, about the same needed to power seven light bulbs. Is this worth it? According to the European Space Agency, technology was only a few years away from being able to accomplish this with solar panels. Why are we doing this? Because Rock, Lockheed built the rocket and the RTGs? Even their own executives are going to expire if Cassini misfires. Then what would happen? Then what would happen? people all started getting sick all at the same time, what would they do? Turn on the TV. No, you're not getting sick. It's only a cold. No, you're not getting sick. Oh, you are sick. Looks like everybody's getting sick. Mulder, Scully, what do you do? <laughs> Wear sunglasses and stay indoors. Read the Bible. Watch video. And since this is all somehow Saddam Hussein's fault, we might as well tell you, you all have six months to live. 
then what would happen? Now it's over. It's really over. What matters now? Nothing matters now. Can you imagine what would happen if everyone on earth all realized that at once? Nothing matters anymore. Law and order? Why bother? It's now or never to do all those things we always wanted to do right now. Open hybrid, break down doors, cow chipping, armored car chipping, <laughs> bank stripping, shopping mall free for all, lose downtown, piss anywhere, rifle through people's houses, play with their special secret things. <laughs> Self-control. CEOs sail out windows just like 1929. High wire their BMWs and play Mad Max chicken on the golf course. <laughs> Royal Q police officers at major intersections during permanent rush hour. Burn, kill, annihilate, destroy, pillage, the ultimate mini-series, the LA There's not much left anyway. I'm bored now. <laughs> this is getting old. I feel sick. It really doesn't matter anymore. Armageddon all around us. Bruce Willis cannot save us. <laughs> <laughs> each other all about each other or we'll never know. Nail the apartment shut and stash plenty of food. TV still works. We can drop acid every day. <laughs> Hold me now. Please. I need you. Back. Anti-abortion pizza, aftershave, 
like a rock. Everything you want for the beer and left. And let's not forget life insurance. Just can't hit them during close-ups on the instant replay. So ladies and gentlemen, are you ready? Your favorite queer bashing orange juice lady will now push the button. The crane booms ride. The crowd goes insane! Let the internet be the tip of the 
die first. So when people notice that propaganda outlets like CNN are lying again, they just get on TV and broadcast their own news instead. I had a dream that some patriotic citizen will one day bring up world peace by breaking into the Defense Department computers of the United States and erasing everything they know. <laughs> that all five will reign in the arms race the easy way and stop producing the radioactive isotope tritium. According to Paul Leventhal of the Nuclear Control Institute, about 6% of the nuclear warheads in the world will automatically become obsolete each year, the rate at which tritium nat naturally decays. And I dream that our billion dollar NASA and Star Wars toys do something useful and retrieve and bring back to Earth all those corroding, obsolete Russian nuclear satellites and our own, bring them back to Earth and take them apart before they break apart and crash like they did in the Northwest Territories already, and poisonous with radiation. The downtown tourist and business facilities be taxed fairly to pay for transit and bus systems so the people who shop and work there can ride there for free. The subway trains and walls be coated with rubbery Teflon with spray paint available to anybody who wants it. <laughs> With music and the news being so censored these days, graffiti is the last frontier of free speech. <laughs> I have a dream that we will wake up one, all wake up and quit wasting so many paper plates, paper napkins, yeah. paper towels, yeah. paper and plastic bags, yeah. and bring cloth bags to the store instead, and that all of us, even lawyers, will recycle paper the easy way by writing on the other side. <laughs> How about a law restricting all junk mail to one three by five car each? <laughs> Even if you've won a million dollars, there's got to be from public and clearing out or something, there's got to be a way to put that on a little car. And I dream that all those patents for fuel-efficient solar and electric cars that certain corporations are sitting on be unsealed and put to use. And for that matter, think of what we'd say if our cars ran on urine. <laughs> <laughs> I dream not just of hemp farms, but energy farms, solar farms, windmill farms. Pollution-free energy is a far more honest way to make a living than being paid by the government not to grow corn. Have you ever heard of uh, this law that was briefly passed in America before the Supreme Court threw, threw it out? It was a Reagan, yet another Reagan cause championed by Clinton for the line item veto, where Congress passes a law and the president, instead of having to veto the whole bill and send it back, he doesn't want to sign it, can cross out what he doesn't like and send it back. How about giving us the line item deal on our income taxes? <laughs> By that I mean, imagine the impact if we could all choose what percentage of our money went where. I'll bet education and the environment would go straight up, and the arms race and the prison building boom would go straight down. <laughs> Overpopulation. And I'm very excited 
about this talk of a possible gene that may predetermine whether or not a person is gay. Now biotech gene splicing can help us. If one, two, three generations of people were all predisposed to be gay, hey, it's the most humane way I can think of to bring down the population of the earth. <laughs> starvation, and war. There's still be plenty of kids left to adopt, and if the immigrant bashers panic because the kids ain't all white, so what? How does that suck up the planet any worse than white people already have? <laughs> equation, equation. Does diagramming sentences teach communication? Where is the real world preparation? Out there, not much is going to improve till we understand why different kinds of people want what they want and think the way they do. More theater classes and acting interaction exercises starting in kindergarten, people acting out other people's roles, getting inside their heads, might lead to a lot better understanding later on. It's sure to a lot better character than just pushing everybody into football. <laughs> and how about real drug and sex education? Right now, for the most part, it's just people being talked down to, don't fuck, don't do drugs, don't live, don't have fun. Your reward shall be to turn out as boring as we are. <laughs> Why date, rape, find them, feed them, fuck them, forget them will not bring lasting love and satisfaction. Maybe fraternity guys can finally get dates. <laughs> but there is a difference between fucking and making love. And imagine an elective class you could sign up for using drugs. Level one. <laughs> to recreational drugs, you can do them a few times, feel the thrill, ride the high, learn what you can from them, and then move on. But it doesn't work that way for everybody. Guiding people through the first time or two so they know what it's like, the up, the down, how much is too much, and maybe people who discover that they've got problems and addictive personalities can admit it to themselves and get help early on so hardcore addiction and ODs later on won't keep killing my friends. And how about a mandatory class on one of the most important things we're supposed to learn that ain't even taught in school at all? People go on and on about how children are the future, and we have to do this or that for the children. How better schools won't help without better family life at home. So why is it we don't spend one goddamn dime in the school system teaching people how to raise kids? <laughs> to teach real people how to solve real problems in the real world. All the calculus in the world cannot teach somebody how to be a parent. How much does a child eat? How much will it cost to feed and clothe and educate and just plain relate to someone who's going to be depending on you 24 hours a day for the next 18 to 30 years? <laughs> parents a class. We're told it's the hardest, most important job of all, 
then everybody gets thrown into it completely unprepared. And the same mistakes get made again and again and again. Addicted to bad doctors, we do the wrong thing like we're told when sometimes real answers lie right under our nose. I have a dream. Not to hide. 
If I ask them what a race riot was, they tell me. If I ask them, Daddy, what's Vietnam, they tell me. Nevertheless, I was terrified of going to South New Mexico over spring vacation because I was afraid I might run into some greasy Mexican Frito Bandinos there with bullet belts and big hats and near me as they lean against the dirty buildings and like grab me and run off with me on the back of a horse like I'd seen them do in so many westerns and cartoon shows. I was all for Negro civil rights, but when I saw in my weekly reader, the little school kid newspaper, that Native American Indians wanted rights too, I couldn't believe their nerve. How dare they ask for rights after all the trouble they've caused on Daniel Boone. <laughs> I grew up in Boulder, Colorado, about four miles from the Rocky Flats nuclear weapons plant. Only time will tell what that did to my brain. <laughs> In first grade, on the playground, we play war. Sometimes even I find myself joining the pack of boys, all chasing one other kid dubbed the Jap, all over the playground yelling, <laughs> A lot of times, hit me later, the Jap was the only Vietnamese kid in our grade. He never did seem very friendly. <laughs> I never heard of God until about third grade. The same year, I had to stay after school one day and write over and over again, I will not laugh during flag pledge. I will not laugh during flag pledge. Even my mom still laughs over that. <laughs> At home, my dad would read us Greek, Roman, and Egyptian mythology and bedtime stories, and I had a choice to discover and decide on my own whether or not to believe in God. That summer, on a family vacation, my dad drove me through the ghettos of Detroit, Michigan, to show me up close why people get mad and start riots. It was exciting. I got to go to a big city, saw the Henry Ford Car Museum, and I got to see some real slums. By the time we got back to my grandparents' place on the other side of Michigan, Detroit was on fire, and my grandparents had a color TV, broadcasting the worst riots up to that point in American history. Vietnam blew up in everyone's face. By fifth or sixth grade, everyone in my school knew who was for and who was against the war. The smiling storybook policeman was now a symbol of violent brutality and hate, especially after my dad came home from a trip to California saying a Los Angeles police officer had stuck a shotgun in his belly when he came out to ask why they run barbed wire down the middle of a horseshoe-shaped motel where he was trying to run a social work conference. He said the cop was shaking as much as he was. <clears throat> Anti-war protests were a regular event across the street from my elementary school at the University of Colorado. Somewhere I still have my souvenir student strike band. I was one of the first kids in school to have long hair. Paid for it, too. Somewhere around then was when my parents quit buying Coors beer. Is there Coors up here? Yeah. How many people are aware that the Coors family has been one of the leading fine funders of extreme right-wing causes in the United States this whole century? Good. Well, it tastes like shit. <laughs>
Then one spring morning, my sixth grade teacher had the gall to start off the class by praising the National Guard for shooting four anti-war protesters to death at Kent State. Something inside me snapped. Something inside me said, this will not stand. This will not stand. Not for me, anyway. Not now. Not ever. To rub it in, they forced us to sing almost all patriotic songs in the spring music program that year, but at least I had a way of getting back at them. I was the worst singer in the class. <laughs> the one who gets singled out to sing, shopping jingles on key. In seventh grade geography class, there was a long detailed unit on Soviet communist propaganda techniques. How their government decided people's careers for them. How they manipulated the masses through billboard slogans and slanted news reporting. They didn't even bother to tell people what the government didn't want people to know. How their school books rewrote history, said a Russian invented the light bulb. So in eighth grade, I thought, hmm, I wonder if these same propaganda techniques in the American history books, too. What do you know? They were. Columbus discovered America. Eurocentric land grab speculators and religious fanatics came to visit and decided to stay and make the so-called New World <coughs> civilized. It was bad enough finding out there wasn't a Santa Claus. Then I found out George Washington and Thomas Jefferson owned slaves and that such patriotic hero icons of the American Revolution as John Hancock and Samuel Adams were, by modern definition, terrorists. <coughs> that our country was founded by agribusiness plantation pot growers who didn't feel like paying taxes, and that sounds familiar. <laughs> that those pilgrims with the guns and roses hat, we had to draw pictures of in elementary school before every Thanksgiving, were as whacked out of their mind as Pat Robertson, and later gave us the Salem witch trial. That Father Sarah and the conquistadores from the Yankee cavalry weren't so civilized towards the natives after all. Did a Russian really invent the light bulb? How will we ever know? Much later, I found some old issues of Fortune magazine from early 1941, several months before the Japanese bomb Pearl Harbor. And these magazines are chock full of full-page, state-of-the-art advertising from those same global corporations we know and love today, bragging about all the money they were going to make when America entered World War II. Then I found out General Motors helped supply both the Allies and the Nazis, then sued the American government after the war for buying their munitions factory in Dresden, and one. <laughs> when I was 15, starting high school, I got called into the counselor's office. Eric, it's time for us to sit down and plan your career.
cool. <laughs> so I tried my sincere best and entered in my life stories, my interests that I like theater, broadcasting, music, forensics, all the cool classes that are now being cut out of the American school system because people are too busy spending their kids' inheritance to pay any taxes to keep up the school. Although they're happy to pay for more jails to pay for what happens to undereducated kids later on. <coughs> anyway, I told the computer I was good at English and social studies and whether I like it or not, math. And the computer clickety clutched for a while, as they used to do back then, and finally sat back on a card that I should spend my high school years preparing for, preparing to become a devil hygiene. <laughs> What is like that to look forward to? I guess I should stick to daydreaming. That great spin of the American education system I first got yelled at and dragged around the class by the hair for in second grade. Daydreaming. Daydreaming. Of a Walter Mitty Cinderella ambition like starting a band. But that's just a dream. Because this is the 1970s. The sober, stupid, boring 1970s that only a bonehead would want to bring back any part of in any form. <laughs> when we were coming of age, we were dazed and confused. We were disgusted. <coughs> we missed the 60s. Got all over TV and 
Life magazine, and they would, why can't we do something? Oh, no, no, it's too expensive. They're not civilized. They, they might waste the food. Well, you know that one. Anyway, me and my friend John Greenway would sit around night making up names for bands, names for people in bands, names for songs. And the one I picked, see, for the name, seemed to have more staying power than some of the others on this 77 punk list, like Smegma Pig Vomit, or <laughs> Mucus Melanoma, or some of the other ones in there. Oh, can you imagine the look on Oprah Winfrey's face on that show I was on with Pippa Gore? She had to introduce me as Smegma Pig Vomit. <laughs> From that point onward, would have been possible if I clung to my original vow to always rebel by never giving in. I would never change. I would be the last die-hard hippie on earth. <laughs> Other people might be selling out, cutting off their hair, styling it or whatever, but I would never change because there was only one true way to rebel, and that's the way it would be forever. Well, I'm glad I didn't lock myself into being one thing in one uniform for the rest of my life, like so many older punks who should know better are doing now. <laughs> Sometimes people ask me, how can you remember all this stuff? How could I forget? How could anybody forget? It makes me really sad and a little alarmed when someone my age I haven't seen in many years tells me I remember more of their own childhood than they do. <clears throat> that they have no tangible personal memory of Vietnam or even Watergate. We were 16 by then. It was on everyone's list. Senator Sam, those hearings over that soap opera all summer. It was a hell of a lot more fun than Monica's magic orifice. Nixon was going to die. Well, no, they don't even remember that. They'll tell me I don't remember much of anything from back then. I guess I had a bad childhood. But I started humming a TV commercial no one's heard in years. Bing! They recognized me instantly. That's scary. Why? On my 14th birthday, the same day as the O.J. Simpson chase, future sham cult figure G. Gordon Liddy and his CIA renegade friend were caught red-handed in the Watergate apartment building breaking into Democratic Party headquarters in what supposedly was a clean election, in what supposedly was a free country. Burnouts and stopping the Vietnam War or not, people fought back. We were pissed. But did we learn? Did we remember? Contragate is still with us and way, way worse. Government dope dealing, assassination, CIA drug running, the Inslaw software theft scandal, Iraq gate, the BCCI bank scandal which got swept under the rug, and now, at least down south, all that energy went to getting rid of Nixon, but now almost any echelon and level of government you look at, it's nothing but a bunch of Nixon. The mask is off again, but this time we embrace the faith. I wonder why these things just don't register anymore. I couldn't even get kicked out of jury duty when I showed up to court wearing a Millions of Dead Cops t-shirt. <laughs> Nowadays, people are asleep. Nowadays, we've let ourselves be programmed to believe that O.J., John Benet, Monica, Diana are bigger, more important things to worry about than the hundreds of billions of dollars being stolen by corporate robber barons and Pentagon contractors in the great Reagan, Bush, Clinton swindle still going on. Money we could be using to solve real problems right now. Nowadays, we're programmed to believe that everything from immigrants of a different skin color to Snoop Doggy Dog 
are more responsible for tearing apart our social fabric than conniving, greedy Republicans. <laughs> and if the fall of the Japanese, or even the paparazzi, the, the hijacked, unconstitutional American government of the people, by corporations, for corporations, must be overthrown. Somewhere out there is what the late folk singer Phil Oakes once called the real America. And I agree that there is something in my land and people that is worth trying to hang on to. And it ain't all gone in the past with the old school or whatever it supplies up here too. Go out and find it. Feel it. Touch it. Create it. I repeat, the 90s may not be pleasant, but they sure as hell ain't boring. Buy my soda, said the Moose Diary of Salesman. <laughs> Uh, here, here, here. Now time gets a little more real here, maybe. Uh, 
and uh, kind of like like the the, 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 the columnist who articulates the views of yuppie Republican soccer moms from hell. <laughs> Once a year, we can use the pause button and blot out the moans of the victimized in our culture. This is Thanksgiving, remember? <laughs> Clearly, no country is more in need of the Thanksgiving holiday than we. For one day a year, we give the complaining a rest and acknowledge that life isn't so horribly wretched. In that spirit, I have compiled a list of things for which I am thankful. <laughs> Electric blankets. <laughs> Towels from the dryer. Steve Young. Wide padded bicycle seat. <laughs> Helen Hunt. Refund. Free valet parking. Any movie with Harrison Ford. The X Files. Credit card gas pump. Parking meters with time left. There, I feel calm and satisfied already. Don't worry, be greedy. The economy is booming after all. Booming for who? <coughs> I don't know whether it's gotten this severe up here or not, but in America there are now estimated to be 2.1 million people who are homeless. The supposed richest country in the world. Where did my little note thing go? There? there it is. And the food banks that exist, who of course aren't getting donations from yuppie soccer mom from hell or anybody like that, are already swollen to the breaking point and there's a new round of welfare cuts coming down. A study done jointly by the American government at Columbia University says, concluded that 22% of American kids are growing up poor and 6.1 million are growing up hungry. Eight, and a lot of it's because of the welfare cuts flashed to the bone by the Clinton-Gingrich regime as to balance the budget you recall, and the welfare budget is only 3% of the American national budget compared to 53% or so for bombs, soldiers. No, I sure don't. You're, <laughs> you're, you're going to get stuck with American stuff, and I'd rather talk about what I know than uh, pretend to talk about Canadian stuff. You probably know a lot more about than I do. Is that cool? Yeah. <laughs> but you get my point. So the problem is when you throw the baby out with the bathwater, quite literally, uh, and, and cutting welfare, some, some of the unintended consequences are it's much harder for women to flee domestic violence because as soon as they do, they can't get housing, government housing or anything. You've got to go out and get a job. You can't get welfare unless you get a job, yet women's place is in the home, but not for you. You're too poor. You've got to go get a job or you can't get your welfare check. And Clinton called a press conference last summer to trumpet how great his welfare reform was because 1.4 million people were gone off the welfare roll. In addition to another 1.9, he took office. Gone where? Well, at least where I am, there are uh, now a lot of freeway entrances and in the middle of intersections. I guess here they call people squeegee kids and stuff. But uh, in America, it's not just kids. It's people of all ages and stuff holding up signs saying homeless will work for food as the cars drive by, things like that. And it's been going on long enough. People who are too young to remember what things were like before Reagan started wrecking everything, um, this didn't used to be that severe. But anyway, that's where they've gone. And they tell people, oh, you have to go get a job to get on welfare. These workfare jobs, as they call them, are often sub-minimum wage, and they're designed to replace city government workers doing menial jobs who they've been paying union wages to and things. 
just fire them all, and then when they get stuck on welfare because they don't have a job, hire them back, no union, no benefits for less than minimum wage, no safety regulations anymore either. Another casualty of this is people are quitting school in mass because they have to get workfare jobs instead of studying at the university to try and get some kind of a, a real job, things like that. And uh, a lot of these unemployment things would be solved, of course, if we just went to a 30-hour work week. Yeah. And then for the other three days of the week, you hired somebody else to keep the job, to keep doing the same job. And the corporate people go, oh, we can't afford that. We can't make any money that way. That's what they say in that kind of media. But if you look at their own media, the business publications and stuff, <laughs>
I mean, people whose skin is the wrong color have their cat, their hat turned the politically incorrect direction, get stopped and shook down repeatedly.